Racial discrimination and injustice pervade virtually every aspect of our criminal justice system. This video focuses on racial bias in the death penalty. Despite the cruel and unusual punishment clause, the Constitution clearly permits the death penalty. The Fifth Amendment outlines specific procedures to be used in capital crimes, or crimes for which the death penalty is imposed. So it was a great surprise to many people when the Supreme Court declared the death penalty unconstitutional in the 1972 case of Furman v. Georgia. The court was more divided on this case than on almost any other case in its entire history. The vote was 5 to 4, and every single justice wrote an opinion. The five justices in the majority were divided into two major camps. Justices William Brennan and Thurgood Marshall believed that the death penalty was cruel and unusual by its very nature, and it therefore violated the Eighth Amendment. In fact, for the next 20 years, Brennan and Marshall voted against the death penalty in every case that came before them. The other three justices in the majority did not believe that the death penalty was inherently cruel and unusual. Like Brennan and Marshall, however, they were concerned with the manner in which it was imposed. They noted that the decision of whether or not to impose the death penalty was almost completely arbitrary, with some defendants being sentenced to death while other, similar defendants are not. Justice Stewart called it so wantonly and so freakishly imposed. Justice Brennan wrote, The conclusion is virtually inescapable that the death penalty is being inflicted arbitrarily. Indeed, it smacks of little more than a lottery system. No one has yet suggested a rational basis that could differentiate in those terms the few who die from the many who go to prison. And, of course, the decision isn't entirely random, because it is far more likely to be imposed on poor defendants. Justice Powell noted that, it is an unequal punishment in the way it is applied to the rich and to the poor. The defendant of wealth and position never goes to the electric chair or to the gallows. Juries do not intentionally favor the rich, the law is theoretically impartial, but the defendant with ample means is able to have his case presented with every favorable aspect. And, of course, the system is infected with racism. Justice Marshall reviewed death penalty statistics, which revealed that, it is immediately apparent that Negroes were executed far more often than whites in proportion to their percentage of the population. Studies indicate that, while the higher rate of execution among Negroes is partially due to a higher rate of crime, there is evidence of racial discrimination. The dissenting justices dismissed these concerns. Chief Justice Berger wrote, The have-nots, in every society always have been subject to greater pressure to commit crimes and to fewer constraints than their more affluent fellow citizens. This is, indeed, a tragic byproduct of social and economic deprivation, but it is not an argument of constitutional proportions under the Eighth or Fourteenth Amendment. The Furman decision had the effect of commuting the sentences of every inmate on death row in the United States at the time. One of the beneficiaries was noted murderer Charles Manson, who had been scheduled to die but instead lived for another 45 years. After the Furman decision, states started making changes to their death penalty procedures to hopefully make them less arbitrary. They split death penalty trials into two parts. In the first part, the jury was asked to decide whether the defendant was guilty or not. If they return a guilty verdict, they then proceed to the second part of the trial, in which they determine whether or not to recommend the death sentence. During the sentencing phase of the trial, jurors are presented with both aggravating factors and mitigating factors. Prosecutors present evidence of aggravating factors, which consist of things that would make a jury more likely to recommend the death penalty. For example, if the defendant is a repeat offender, or if the crime committed was particularly heinous or cruel, the jury would be more justified in sentencing the defendant to death. Similarly, killing certain kinds of victims, such as judges or police officers, is also considered an aggravating factor, as is committing a murder while engaged in other crimes. Defense attorneys have an opportunity to present mitigating factors that would make a jury less likely to impose the death penalty. Examples of mitigating factors include things such as a history of suffering from physical or emotional abuse, if the defendant displays genuine remorse, and lack of a previous criminal record. For years after Furman v. Georgia, the court revisited the issue in the case of Gregg v. Georgia. 
This time, a majority of the court found that the changes that states had made were sufficient to reduce the arbitrariness with which the death penalty was imposed, and it upheld the death penalty by a 7-2 vote, with only Brennan and Marshall in dissent. However, to this day, studies continue to consistently show that black defendants are still far more likely to be sentenced to death than white defendants. African Americans make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but about 42% of death row inmates. Furthermore, according to a comprehensive study published in 2019 in the Harvard Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Law Review, defendants who kill white victims are 17 times more likely to be sentenced to death than defendants who kill minority victims. The Supreme Court was forced to directly confront statistics like this in the case of McCleskey v. Kemp in 1987. McCleskey was an African-American man who had been sentenced to death in Georgia. In his appeal, he presented the results of a pathbreaking statistical study that demonstrated that the death penalty in Georgia was imposed at much higher rates against black defendants than white defendants, and that killers with white victims were more likely to be sentenced to die than killers of black victims. He said that this was proof that it violated the Equal Protection Clause, and was therefore unconstitutional. The court disagreed. It dismissed the statistics altogether by saying, to prevail under the Equal Protection Clause, McCleskey must prove that the decision-makers in his case acted with discriminatory purpose. He offers no evidence specific to his own case that would support an inference that racial considerations played a part in his sentence. Instead, he relies solely on statistics. Statistics, at most, may show only a likelihood that a particular factor entered into some decisions. There is, of course, some risk of racial prejudice influencing a jury's decision in a criminal case. There are similar risks that other kinds of prejudice will influence other criminal trials. If we accepted McCleskey's claim that racial bias has impermissibly tainted the capital sentencing decision, we could soon be faced with similar claims as to other types of penalty. The result is that no matter how disproportionately a state imposes the death penalty on minority defendants, there is nothing a defendant can do about it unless they can find evidence of racial discrimination in their individual case, which is almost always impossible to do.